All right, this is the first objective in engineering processes and secure design is the topic. So we're going to go over how to implement and manage engineering processes using secure design principles. Okay, so as you're looking at developing systems for your organization, as and during the CISSP, that's going to be a big part of this, is that you need to consider security in all stages of system development. And programmers should, should work really, really hard to create a secure environment in the development space. And so as you deal with multiple security pieces of the puzzle, it's important that, that you build this into it. And the reason I say that is in the past, all these systems used to be independent. They used to be self-supporting. Uh, they, they weren't really designed with a lot of interconnectivity. They also didn't have all of the networking that we have currently today so it was a it, it was a very different world than it is obviously now and so because of that as an application developer or any sort of developer as it relates to software you need to consider using secure software development lifecycle and as a CISSP and person who's going to be running security for an organization you need to consider that as you are one vetting out development companies to do your development or two if you have it in-house how are they doing it in a way that is the most secure the following are key security items for a secure design, and we're going to kind of go through those. And the really what it comes down to is we'll get into objects and subjects. The object is, is basically a resource that is used by the subject. A good example would be a computer system or a mainframe or something like that. So that is it's an actual physical object or that's running a subject, right? And a subject is a user or process requesting access. So that could be an individual, it could be an RPA, like a robot process algorithm. And those are interesting, actually. I've run into the RPAs in that it, way to think of it is just basically a macro on steroids. And it uses an algorithm, and it also can do some machine learning as its thought process. But basically it comes down to is it's just a really highly performance, highly functional algorithm that slash macro that does all of that for you. So you got objects and you got subjects. You also have closed and open systems. Now your closed system is a design that works very specifically in a very narrow range. So you have a closed environment. So in the military, we used to have uh, networking systems that would be connected to airplanes. And those are in a very closed, tight range system. They are designed to work specifically with those machines. They're not designed or created to be plugged into your local your local network. They're very specific closed systems. They're defined by the manufacturer and they are, they're designed specifically for a specific purpose. They can be more secure because one, there's a couple of reasons. One is because they are independent. So you, you don't have the same issues that you would have with a system that has been, it's got lots of interconnectivity. It's an independent system specifically for a single or a couple purposes, right? The downside of that though, is the fact that because it's so unique and it's such a niche, in many cases, they're not updated and managed at the same level a commercial grade system that goes inside your network would be. Again, military technology systems. And that's why they cost so much is because they're independently operated and independently managed from the stuff that we would get, we call COTS, uh, commercial off the shelf type of product. Uh, when I flew B1s, we had systems on there that were worth like a million dollars for one box. And it did a very specific thing. And you can't just go buy that computer and stick it into your downtown. You just can't do it. It, it was made specifically for the B1 and its systems. Now, an open system is it's agreed upon an industry standard. So what is the standard used by the industry to help with that specific system? Uh, a good example of that would be Windows. I mean, Windows is an industry standard. It's a, and the networking that we use, uh, Wi-Fi, it's, it's an industry standard. Uh, when you're dealing with the new, uh, uh, what do you call it? It's basically not LTE, but it's the next version, all right? So the new version of um, wireless, and I cannot think of it for the life of me, but bottom line is you know, it uses millimeter wave technology. That's going to be built on a standard. Um, it's much easier to integrate with other systems because the standard is published, it's known, and, and they can utilize it. It's, it's many more options, especially within a network. However, because it is so open, in some, res some respects, it can be less secure. Now, I say that in also like the open source world, um, where this is an open system, where everybody has access to development. 
it, it it may be a little bit more less secure because of the fact that everybody can find the faults. But the good thing of that is everybody can find the faults. Uh, a close another closed system that I didn't really mention would be like um, a Windows system itself. So Windows it, it's open to some extent for because it's built on standards, but it's also closed because they don't want to share their proprietary information. So it's a little bit of a mix. But an example like that today is a computer a current computer system is more of an open type system. So closed and open source code. So you, your closed source is your very much your proprietary code, which would be Windows, right? That's your, that's what they use for creating the window. They don't want that code getting out to anybody. And they, it can be designed for both the open and closed systems. Uh, as an example, there are um, there's Android, that's which is an open source, right? And that has been used in many military planes. I know they do use Windows CE in some things. Uh, and so they but you the key thing with that is you are reliant upon the manufacturer for updates they have to give you the updates to make sure it's up to and it's connected now the challenge with that is, is that let's say you're in a manufacturing facility and it's a closed network you can't get in, anything into it well one the manufacturer has to provide updates two you have to install them it's not like an automated kind of solution now you can do the automated solution but in many cases that's not what what a lot of companies will do it's also developed by third parties, so it's not specifically open to the world to just be able to develop for it. Uh, a third party will develop it, or if you're doing it in-house like Microsoft, but I know they also outsource some of that work. Open source is the code that's available to the public. You'll see that with the Android platforms that come from that came from Google, and, and those are all open source type of products. Um, they're, they're, des they're designed for open and closed systems because I know Linux systems that are used within various enterprises, uh, they, but they rely on the community for updates. And so therefore, because the community is seeing them on a daily basis, they can hopefully find flaws in them and then the community has to come up with an update for it. They're not reliant or behooven upon the vendor to provide that. It, it can be obscure. Open source can cause some risk and depending on the size of it, you don't really have sometimes have good quality control on the the code that you might be using. Uh, so there could be code or bad code that's hidden in your code. I mean, because nowadays they're talking, I was in a, a meeting with their police department and the police department, they have their cars are all interconnected and their cars have over a million lines of code just in their police cars or squad cars. Well, so now if you have a bunch of open source, and you have a million lines of code. Well, it costs money to debug and go through all of that code. So in many cases, People will throw out open source code going, hey, I can use this. And they kind of like use it like building blocks. Grab a little here, grab a little there, put something together, bada boom, bada bing, they're done. Um, there, there can be downsides of that, though, if, especially if there are, there's not a lot of updates to that system. Some good examples of open source, obviously, is self-driving cars, 3D printing, etc. And it allows for a lot of innovation and optimization. But there's pros and cons that come, there are trade-offs with all of these. So some techniques to maintain the CIA or the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. There's some various techniques that software developers can use. And we're going to talk about a few of these right, right now. But any of the following, they can be used for software development. It's not all inclusive, but these are some good ideas that you can use if you're dealing with the software development lifecycle. First one is confinement. So you need to restrict users, process, access, and actions to a program. So this is basically where you are sitting down and you have this development environment and you are limiting access to it or processes. They're limiting your process access to the, a specific program. So that's confining it to a specific location. Um, it, it'll allow a process to read write from specific locations. So you allow some connections back in and out of it, but you have very specific requirements on what you're allowing in and what you're allowing out. A sandbox is what you'll commonly hear, and it's it's basically a place where you can go play. It's a place to restrict what you can operate. It keeps you in there, but anything that bad that happens in the sandbox, other than finding cat poo, that might be someone a cat may have buried into your sandbox. Um, the, outside of that, they place restrictions on where you can specifically operate, and you must meet and operate with higher security when you're dealing with confinement. It, it's just it's you because you're putting everything in this bucket, you're tightening down the screws and the entry, entry and exits, you have to have a higher standard. And, and therefore, because we have a higher standard, it can cause some challenges that you have to go through. So a good example is, is only a specific, specified systems can operate against a specified database. And you can see this with any even AWS. You have a system and you only allow the routing to talk to a specific database basically to put to dump data into the database or to take data out 
The moment that you allow anybody that can connect to that database, you now lose control. That is keeping confinement. That if something happens, it's confined to that location. And, and it's any system that's outside of that specific scope, again, is not allowed. So you have very strict criteria on what you let in and what you let out. Bounds. So this is a defined process that's given specific authority to operate. Okay, so there you have you, spe you set specific boundaries that this process can operate. And it, it may be in the situation where it's the user, the kernel, or the administrator, but you give them very specific criteria. And by doing that, the kernel only operate at a certain level. The user, if they don't have admin account credentials, they can only operate at a certain level. Administrators can only operate at a certain level, unless, quote unquote, they're like a domain admin, which basically is the God credentials for that network then that situation is that can get out of hand really quickly. So therefore, you need to be very careful on how you set your boundaries for these various users accounts. Um, now, bounds on a process defines what is allowed. So depending upon your operating system, what can your operating system do? What can it do? What is it? Able, what kind of connectivity can it have? What can it not have? How much memory do you have and do you leak memory? Um, hardware, what are your limitations around hardware and what can it and cannot do? Um, so th those are, it's important to set these boundaries and it's important that they are set uh, because malware will utilize errors that are set in your boundaries to basically bust through and get access to your environment. Um, a good exa an example is the kernel manipulation. So you can have it set up where typically the kernel is segregated off by itself. It's not something that you can actually get into. Uh, or you should want to get into, right? But if there's errors in the operating system or in the processes, it could potentially be available for people to take advantage of it. So you, again, you have to set boundaries on what the system can and cannot do. Process isolation. Okay, so this is only where a specific process can operate within memory. So you only, they can only run this specific thing. Uh, anything outside of these parameters, it won't run. Um, now, it that the bullet talks about a stable system. The moment you have parameters or processes running outside of the standard areas that you put them in, the swim lanes that you put them in, that's when the system become can become unstable. And then what ends up happening is, so let's just go, for example, you have a system and you allow uh, this kind of access that you shouldn't, and it is no longer stable. It causes issues with the kernel, and then now you get the dreaded blue screen of death, things reboot, and now the bad guy can take advantage of such situations as that. The other thing with process isolation is it will prevent applications from directly accessing memory from other locations. You may They may need to access memory, but they may have very specific locations where they can access it. Outside of those very specific locations, not allowed. Uh, an example we have up there is cut, paste, and copy. Those are allowed to transition between areas. Um, and, and so there might be a situation where you don't want screen captures to happen. That would be something you would deny. And so that's the whole purpose of it is, is that it's setting very specific process isolation. Now they talk about there, but macros, these can run outside defined parameters. Now macros are basically can run independent. And so therefore it's important for you to, to one, disable macros is a good idea. Just turn it off. Don't even have it but ensuring you understand what you're trying to accomplish as it relates to process isolation overall. Okay, so now we're gonna deal with controls, and these are mandatory and discretionary access controls as well. Now, what a control does is it puts limits on access of authorized objects. So it basically limits what you can, an object can and cannot do. And it's designed to limit their access, which in turn will protect the overall system from basically things going awry. Now, an example of that would be file access. If you have too much file access within, uh, or too many people can have access to a specific file, um, that would be bad. Depends. Maybe you want everybody to have read-only, but you only want a few to have modifications. Then that would be a control that you are putting in place to limit it to only to a lot of people to read-only and only a few that can actually make changes. Outside of that, what happens many times is most people are set for modifications as many and read only as few. Why? Because they just kind of set it up, turn it on and forget about it. Now, mandatory and discretionary access controls. These are designed to limit access to objects by the subjects. Okay, so the objects, computer systems, the subjects are the users. They are designed to limit access to them. And a max is subject cannot define the object that can be accessed by the user. So the MAC, which is your mandatory access control, specifically states what can and what cannot be accessed by the user. So if there's a situation where 
there's a computer system that you don't want most users to have access to. That would be a mandatory access control that is set up that only these X amount of people are allowed to have that capability. When you have a discretionary access control, it gives you much more flexibility so that it can be accessed by the user. And a lot of that comes down to is the identity of the user may be granted greater access. So by having that identity, that role, and which we'll talk about later during the CISSP more training is role-based authentication. Having that role will allow them potentially to have greater access with the DAC. Okay, so the DAC's discretionary, MAC is, is mandatory. Okay, these are the references we had for the ISC squared, uh, talking about the training self-study resources for this first session of domain number three. All right, we'll get going and let's roll into the next one.